nation's foremost expert on mass shootings. She's an author of several books and has created the FBI's uh, roadmap on how to deal with uh, responding to mass shootings. She's in town to speak at the library tomorrow, and we're happy to welcome Catherine Schweit to the morning show. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much. It's so wonderful to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity, and I'm embarrassed to say uh, when I get introduced that way, but uh, you know, everybody has a job to do, and yeah. those are the jobs that I was assigned. So. So your, your first job, though, was as a sports reporter in Jackson. It was. <laughs> I worked, uh, I, when I uh, turned 18, the day after I turned 18, I walked down to the Citizen Patriot and signed up to be anything, because I was going to be a journalist. Yeah. That was my plan. So I signed up to be anything I could, and they assigned me photos, and then I started working sports. And so I was a sports writer all the way through college. I went to Michigan State, and... Um, and then um, loved working on yeah. that. And then I worked in Three Rivers. I'm very local. Yeah. I'm local. I worked in Three Rivers at the paper and then moved on to Chicago. So you're often referred to as a mass killing expert. What does that mean? And, and how did you go from a sports writer at the Sit Pat to one of the nation's foremost experts in mass killings? Well, I um, actually, it's, I, I moved to Chicago to take a job in the newspaper business there. And I decided to go to law school because a lot of journalists do go to law school because it just really helps you understand what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And while I was there, um, my cousin, who wasn't actually was an FBI agent, kind of recruited me to join the bureau. And so I came into the FBI. Uh, I spent 20 years there, but 15 years into it, um, the Sandy Hook massacre mm -hmm. happened at the elementary school, and that kind of changed the trajectory of my my world. Sure, you've. Um studied 160 active shooter uh, incidents in the United States. How does studying that many mass shootings, and you mentioned Sandy Hook, that, that first one, that, how does it affect you as, uh, as a person? Yeah, it was, you know, I, um, in the FBI, you do what you're told to do. I'm, I was an agent in the FBI. I was working national security matters. But when I got plucked kind of out of the hallway to say, hey, you're going to figure out, do you join this, go over to the White House, join this team at uh, then Vice President Biden's office with a handful of other people from federal agencies, you just think, OK, it's another job. And I'm just going to do another job. And But then in order to understand the problem of mass shootings in the United States, I had to spend a tremendous amount of time with people who've been impacted by mm. it. People who were at the scene all the time. I had been at the scene, like the Holocaust shooting in Washington, D.C. I was there, and, and because that's part of what the FBI does. And it, it grates on you, and you begin to see that it's not just a number. In a news story, sometimes we say, oh, there's, there's 12 people who were killed. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's a whole community. It's the people. Right. And, and it, it does. It, I really... It's very gut-wrenching to mm -hmm. talk to parents. I talked to Sandy Hook parents, you know, days after they lost their children. Yeah. And, and it really just sticks with you that you, yeah. you have to just find some way to do something. Mm -hmm. These communities where uh, these tragedies happen, like you said, they become known for it and it does affect the whole community. Bart, have a, Bart and I have a connection to Oxford. My mm -hmm. cousin was a, fr as a freshman, was a freshman during that. And, uh, you know, I was able to see firsthand how that really did in fact affect the entire community and even state. There's so many things probably that we don't realize that goes on. Yeah. Are we numb to all this as a society? You know, I don't think we are numb to it because otherwise it wouldn't bother us. Right. You know, after the Oxford shooting happened, I heard from my, co my uh, niece who has kids in a school in that area. She said, everybody here is afraid to send their kids to school. What kind of advice mm -hmm. can you give? I spent time at their school the prosecutor up there called me and said, let's talk through some things. I think we're all looking for answers and solutions. And that's really what, you know, I think I focused on mm -hmm. every time is it's bad, but a lot of things in life were bad. You know, right. the Holocaust was bad. The pandemic was bad. The depression was bad. The Dust Bowl was bad. We just have to keep plugging away mm -hmm. to get through it. And we can. We've done it before. We'll do it again. Uh, Uvalde was bad. Oh, and yeah. I saw some of the comments you made a afterwards that they had uh, active shooter training at least twice in that district yeah. months before the shooting. Mm -hmm. And you gave them, and you've given every school district all of this information on how to respond. 
but it, it didn't work. What happened? Yeah, I think Uvalde is an anomaly, and I would say I would say this to, especially like to parents out there who are afraid of sending their kids to school. Schools are infinitely safer mm -hmm. than any place. Kids are five times more likely to get killed or injured at home than they are in schools. Mm -hmm. So schools are very, very safe. And, and that situation that traumatizes us about Uvalde is, is something that's, it's an incredible, think about it. I've been researching 25 years of these kind of shootings and been at scenes and talked to people and how many Uvaldes have we had? One. Mm -hmm. So it's not likely to happen again. But the law enforcement officers in that case had the training, but I think what they did is kind of a lot of group think. And you know, we, law enforcement is like everybody else. We hire from the human race mm -hmm. and people are fallible and mistakes were made there. And, and, the, and the, you, you can't fix those mistakes. And the law enforcement as a group did not do what they should have done and what they were trained to do. Mm -hmm. And I, there's no excuse for it. Yeah. I think people look to you as a, a, a person that has a solution mm -hmm. with all the work you've done on this. What do we do? How do we stop the shootings? I think that, I think that some of the most important things are, you have to remember that um, in all the research that we've done, I've worked with our you know, profilers, as people call them, we call them behavioral experts at, at Quantico uh, for a long time. People want somebody else to solve this problem, or they want the police to solve this problem. Our research, I'm a very much, I'm a data person. I'm a data person. That's why I wrote this book, this first book, you know, uh, Stop the Killing, How to End the Mass Shooting Crisis, which is at the library. So you can check That's it out right. for free. Mm -hmm. Don't buy it if you don't want to. Um, and, <laughs> or buy and it. Buy just it. say, oh, you can buy it. That's okay. <laughs> or you can buy it. That's great. Um, but the reason I uh, and I, you know, I wrote the second book because guns are so controversial, mm -hmm. and I don't, and it doesn't need to be. They don't yeah. need to be. And so this is a non-politics kind of book that talks about so you know about guns enough to talk mm -hmm. about it. But the reason that I wrote this book was because the research is out there that tells us that police aren't going to be the only answer. Mm -hmm. that, just as an example, the, um, the, in school shootings, in middle school and high school shootings, where those shooters come from inside the school, they are students of that school, our research of 62 of them that we could find enough data on, we found 92% of the shooters who actually shot and killed people 92% of the shooters told somebody else in their class about it. Wow. 92%. That's amazing. So that's called leakage, but in addition to that, it's not just an occasional word here or there. Every single person who was involved in one of these shootings had four to five behavioral cues that they gave to other people. They talked to other people, leakage. They they bought you know, the equipment that they need, the black outfits or whatever they think is cool, the handguns, the shotguns, the rifles. If they, had, if they were a hunter, for instance, they started um, and they went, they went out and shot skeet every weekend, they started shooting every day. So they had hmm. these behavioral changes in their, in their the behavioral patterns that everybody saw. And who saw them? 75% or more parents, peers, teachers, Spouses. Amazing. Not, law, you know where law enforcement fits in that? Those are all 75% above, law enforcement fits down at 25%. It's interesting, we don't hear about that in the news, of course, because it's after the fact, right? And right. that doesn't sell as much, but I think with the Oxford, that's when you really understood that there were folks, of course, the parents that yeah. definitely, there were those triggers, of course, so. And uh, tell us a little bit about, is that a little bit about what the book is on? Yeah, the, actually the book is kind of a good, um, very non, you know, non-politics, non-opinionated. I mean, that's my goal, right? Yeah. Um, and that's that journalism, journalism. background, right? Uh, is the idea of you need more data, you need more information to understand how to how to research these things, how to work them. And so, um, the, there are. It's a, you know, what are the behavioral cues you should watch for? And a lot of school districts buy these, a lot of teachers buy these, a lot of parents buy these. Uh, there's a, what are we looking for? Mm -hmm. What are we hoping to find out? Um, like there's a chapter on who are we looking for, how do we look for them, mm -hmm. what do we do with that information. Right. There's, there's chapters on that. But there's also, um, I think importantly, one other thing, there's, there's, a ch there's a chapter in here on training 
for civilians, for, as we would say, law enforcement, for civilians. Um, there's a chapter in here on what is run, hide, fight, how to train for it in a non-scary way, and also a whole section on you should be training your kids. Mm -hmm. and, and I think a lot of times people think, oh, it's too scary to talk about kids, but wouldn't you rather have the conversation with your kids than to have somebody else start it? Yeah. Because schools are training kids in something which a lot of times parents, I'll say, parents, what are, you, what are your kids learning in school? And they'll say, I don't really know what the training is. I haven't mm -hmm. asked. Just cool. ask, just ask. Yeah. It's not a secret. Right. Or they come home as second graders and say, oh, we had active shooter training today. Yeah, that's when you usually <laughs> learn yeah. about it. So you're speaking at the library. Tell us a little bit about what guests will, uh, will be able to take away from your, your event. Well, um, thank you for asking. Um, I'm speaking at the library uh, because I had um, donated some books and I had conversations with them and they said they were really popular, could I come back? And I said, okay, and we started this plan la last fall and so we finally worked it out to come in today to talk about some of the data, some of the facts, some of the c behavioral cues that I was just mentioning. Those are the kind of things that we're gonna cover. Mm -hmm. Some of the behavioral cues, to, what are the things to watch for? Because targeted violence like this is a planned event and that means that the event individual plans it and then acts in, in, in concert to try to find a way to accomplish that violent act. And when they do that, those are vi there are visible signs. Mm -hmm. And so what are those visible signs? That's what we're gonna talk about tonight, a little bit of that. And again, we're not, I'm, I'm, I do, do not scare people. That's mm -hmm. another thing, I, you know, people say, well, I think that's a scary conversation. No, we're not showing bloody people or gunshot victims or not, we're talking about good positive solutions and everybody who leaves should be empowered. Mm -hmm. Everybody who leaves should say, I know more how to stop a mm -hmm. shooting, whether it's in my neighborhood or whether it's in the school or in the mall or whether it's in, uh, you know, whether it's in my church. You mentioned uh, a lot of these cases and talking to folks in the community afterwards and is there ever a, an, a, an answer as to why these happen? Uh, I think that's the, I think that it's the challenge. A lot of people want a one why. Right. But you know, uh, these are shooters are people and everyone has their own why. But what happens is they have a, essentially every single person has a real or perceived grievance. I will say that in the United States, we have many more um, what you think of as like domestic violence situations. We have a lot of, uh, um, we have an increasing number of, of because we're so polarized, an increasing number of shootings that are occurring because of you know race or religion mm -hmm. or uh, and things like that, and that's that's terrible. But that's something that we can all contain, right? Mm -hmm. When you hear somebody who's talking and they're so frustrated about that person who's not their race or their religion or their whatever, step in and and find the common ground. Mm -hmm. Find the common ground because that person is going through something you have no idea what they're going through. It may be that a child who's 18, Oxford's a great example, there's a child who spoke to his parents and spoke to his parents, told the teachers, I'm getting bad grades because I want my parents to notice me. You never know what somebody else is going through, so don't be so quick to judge mm -hmm. um, because many times people are under stress and, that's, and obviously that's what leads them to this. Yeah, and before a lot of these people turn into shooters, they're just kids. It's That's amazing. right. Yeah. 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 So after every one of these, it's thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. Yeah. Get rid of the guns. Uh, right. And but, but we can't get rid of the guns. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a really practical solution. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but I think that it's. It, I think it. The. It's because we have. Um, you know, we we have created really a terrible false narrative of. It's guns or mental health. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it isn't either guns or mental health. Research shows that mental health obviously plays a factor when somebody gets to a certain point, but there are things that get that person to that point. A very small percentage of people have a diagnosable mental health issue. And if somebody has a diagnosable mental health issue and they're getting mental health care, that's what we want them to do. Mm -hmm. So instead, uh, you know, let's not push people away from that. But in, in getting rid of all the guns in the United States, we're past that. I do a podcast. Look, I brought another toy. Hugely podcasts, popular. Po Very popular. Podcasts yeah. are free. Yeah. That's what I always say. Podcasts are free. Stop the killing podcast as I wave it around. Um, and, and, the, and we talk about that on the podcast because my co-host is from London. 
in her very first, our very first podcast in, in our first season, we were in our fifth season now, she said, why don't you guys just get rid of all the guns? Only oh, she said it in that lovely English yeah. accent. <laughs> and, and I said, well, it's more complicated than that in this yeah. country. And it's not, that's not the solution. We know mm -hmm. that. I mean, we have 20 million or more AR-15 style weapons in the United States and, and many more mm -hmm. semi-automatic handguns. So guns are part of the problem. We have this problem in the United States because we have the guns. There, and people who start, whose starting point is, is that it's not the guns. That's, that's wrong, too. I mean, that's mm -hmm. this, it's equally wrong. It, it is the guns. We do have more guns. People don't commit these kinds of violent acts in other countries at this volume with this many injuries because they don't have access to guns. But that's okay. That's where we are, mm -hmm. you know? Well, there's so much more yeah. to uh, hear and uh, ponder. And you are invited to a free presentation by Catherine Schweit at the Jackson District Library. And that is happening tomorrow at 6 p.m. And you can get the books where books are sold. Uh, also listen to uh, Stop the Killing, the true crime podcast, available uh, wherever your uh, podcasts come from. I hope to make it. It sounds yeah. like it's going to be a great night. Thanks for, uh, for taking time to be with us thank today. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, this thank you so much. This has been an honor. My yeah. hometown station. I love mm -hmm. it. Welcome back to Jackson. Thank you. Uh, author and uh, expert on uh, mass shootings, former FBI agent Catherine Schweit. More of the morning show after this.